Thomas Martin. Welcome. Thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Good. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Uh, anyway, glad to be back. I was here a couple years ago. Something yep. like that. Uh, and uh, so, if you've heard me before, I'll have uh, some new information, a little review, and all that. Before I, be, I get going though, I am brought to you by, kind of like a television show, um, three different service providers. Um, Eric is here with Elite Group. I want to say a few words. And uh, he, he, he hasn't said anything yet. He hasn't said, don't clap yet. He hasn't said anything. Uh, so anyway, I'm kidding. Uh, but anyway, Elite is the largest home inspection company in North America. And they have how many inspectors? 55. 55, full time. So they're, they do, and they do a lot of things that nobody else does. But, so uh, you guys have um, got a flyer. If you don't, I'll stay, uh, stick around after the meeting and hand you a flyer and a business card. Um, our pricing, just to get that out of the way, zero to 2,000 square feet starts at 397 for a single family home. Um, after that, every 500 square feet, it goes up $50. Um, so we do have competitive pricing and I'll tell you why. So with every single inspection that you do with the Elite Group, you get uh, free warranties. Now we are not a home warranty company, but we are a home inspection company that cares about our clients. Um, on the back of the flyer, there's uh, details about those different warranties. I won't go too much into it to take, um, that'll take a lot of the time, but just to mention a few, we have sewer guard, mold safe, um, a roof protection plan, a termite protection plan. So those are all limited warranties. Um, a lot of them are 90 days, 60 days. Um, if you have any questions, I'd love uh, to answer them via email. You can give me a call um, after this. But um, the, one of the reasons why people love our company are post-inspection warranties that come into play after the day of the inspection. Another thing is we have a fully staffed call center open Monday through Friday, um, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. and then Saturday, 9 to 5. We do inspections every single day of the week so you can get on the schedule um, on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Um, another thing is um, we are fully protected. We have E&O insurance and our inspectors are certified master inspectors. What does that mean? So you guys know that in the state of, of California, the home inspection industry is unregulated, right? So no one can have um, a license to do home inspection. It's simply a, a choice. Each and every one of us can go out and you know, perform a, a home inspection. So probably, we probably wouldn't want to, you know, especially in this heat, um, but we, we could. Um, now what sets, up, um, sets apart inspectors from the industry is they can get certified to be home inspectors. So we make all of our inspectors go through CMI, which is um, a certification. They go through a thousand hours of training to attain the certification and a hundred hours of training yearly to maintain the certification. Um, now it's um, considered one of the best certifications that you can attain so um, you are safe knowing that your inspector through the elite group is a certified master inspector through proper training. Also we have um, insurance that covers us, you know, our, our clients if there's um, ever any errors um, that on our part, you know, we you are fully covered when you use the elite group So those are just a few things that set, set us apart from uh, the industry average home inspection company I'd love to answer any uh, more of your questions. Um, I have business cards for you guys um, And I can you know answer questions um, after the meeting. So okay. thank you. Great. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Good job. Thank you. Good job. Don now, Don has, you probably know, or might know, has an identical twin that does the same thing in the San Gabriel Valley, and when and her name is Sandy, and whenever I introduce Sandy, I usually say, here's Don, so this is the one real, this is the, the real Don. <laughs> yes, I'm the original. Yeah. The old one, Don Zerbel, First American Home Warranty. We are a home warranty company, and our favorite thing in the whole world is home inspections, just so you know. Nothing makes me happier than a property that has a home inspection not done by their father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even get me started on that. Just had one of them, like, for real? I'm thinking for real, you had your father-in-law do it? Yay! <laughs> they so, know more than anybody. I have I, one. Uh, <laughs> leave it alone. So I can build a house from the ground up at this point. You guys, home warranties is your first line of defense at risk management. The last thing you want to get sued over is a dishwasher, a garbage disposal, or an air conditioner. That's my job, to take care of those things, not your job. I always tell my realtors, if you decide to close without a home warranty, because we are not required by law, and HJ is, lucky them, 
just leave your checkbook, and if you're too young to know what a checkbook is, I'll show you later. Um, <laughs> you just leave it, no, I'll show you. You just leave it open and you sign your name, and we'll show you how to do that too. And you just, every time the buyer has a problem, you're going to take care of it. Because if you don't have a home warranty, they're turning to you for every little thing. And I don't care if you sold the house to your mom. They expect everything to be a brand new house, even though the house was built in 1962. Mm -hmm. So home warranties do not have age exclusions. Everything just has to be working the day they close escrow and break right after. I have one right now where they closed yesterday and the air broke this morning. That happens. Mm -hmm. They have a home inspection showing it was working. They're golden. If you need something, email me, text me, call me. I have known Bob for... 50 years. At least. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, we, were, we were both much younger when we started, yeah. but no, I've known Bob for a long time. He does a great presentation, you guys, and I appreciate your support and look forward to, with Bob, helping you guys stay out of court. Thank you. <laughs> And, and by the way, um, Carolyn with First American NHC, she, she's on her way, right? Yes, Okay, yes. so if she comes in, we'll have her sale. You know, when you mentioned the checkbook and you know about the age thing, the other day somebody asked me a question and I said, well, we don't have much time, let me do the Reader's Digest version. And they go, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Young folks. Yeah, anyway, okay, uh, I always like to start out with pictures I've seen taken that I just think are kind of funny. So here's like a subliminal <laughs> message before you work out, you know, you, want, you feel like a, a Big Mac or something. You know. uh, this is a disclosure sign at an underground parking garage. It's a very honest <laughs> sign. Clearance, not much. You've been warned. Um, I always thought this is kind of odd. This is, uh, and this is a real gym. I live in San Diego. This is in Point, Point Loma. I showed this picture for years and I thought it was Photoshop. People are going to go work out on the Stairmaster and they're taking an escalator. <laughs> but it's, it's real and it look, it, there's, nothing's been photoshopped. It's, in, it, it's off of Rosecrans and Point Loma if you're ever there. But anyway, and I, whenever I've been by, I stop for a second look and nine out of 10 people going to work out take the escalator, so bigger. And then one more thing, old uh, TDS I found, the agent wrote down, home is dealing with several issues. <laughs> <laughs> thinking, uh, a couple of therapy sessions or something and wow. it'll be fine. Okay, enough of that. I will email to Mike uh, probably a little bit later today uh, some seminar notes so you don't need to write anything down. Uh, and so, uh, Thanks, Robert. no, it's okay, thank you. Now I gotta start over. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. Anyway, I know attorneys that have been practicing for like 25 years, and the only lawsuits they've ever litigated are disclosure lawsuits because that's all they've ever seen. They've just never seen another one in real estate. So it's a it's a big topic. So we'll talk about that briefly this morning. Uh, let me start out with what we talked about yesterday in Northridge. Uh, I know that you use AVID when you it's required here at HomeSmart to use AVID when you do your visual inspection. And sometimes I'll like show of hands, how many of you use it? And sometimes I'm asked, well, doesn't everybody have to use it? Well, if a company requires it, yes, but. The BR, it's not, the, it's not a BRE form, it's not a state of California form, totally optional, they don't care about it at all. However, it is so prolifically used in the state of California. I mean, I go, I just go like everywhere, in, don't, don't be envious, but I'll be like in Modesto next week, but I go like, <laughs> I go everywhere and I almost never come across a company now that does not require the use of it. So it's developed into like a stand, not like, it's a standard of care issue. So it's really good to use it for lots of reasons. There's more room to write for one, but there's a lot of liability protections and so forth. Uh, however, the statutory form is the TDS, or the tedious form, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. Only mentions one thing, and I can't use my little laser thing, it doesn't work on the TV, but you see it circled there. Uh, visual inspection, so that's our marching orders on how to fill out the AVID. So a question for us this morning, does that mean that the only things that you should write down on the AVID are things that you actually see, that you can visually look at? No. And, correct. The answer is no. <laughs> and uh, the reason why is because that term on the TDS, which has been on it since it came out in about 1985 and unchanged, uh, really means or has morphed or whatever in court to mean any sensory perception. So it doesn't make any difference if you can see what concerns you, a crack, a stain or something. But uh, what, the, what really makes a difference is whether the buyers will notice it when they move in and in particular if the buyers will be surprised to notice it when they move in. The only buyers that ever sue are buyers that are surprised, caught off guard. If they find gold in the attic, that's okay, they're surprised, but it's gonna be okay. <laughs> it's like the bad news surprises, the negative ones. So if you're doing a visual inspection and you're in the uh, 
family room or whatever, and you're looking at something and wondering, should I disclose that or not? Is it too picky? Forget the debate. Just ask yourself. When the buyers move in and they see that, whatever it is, will they be kind of caught off guard and kind of surprised in kind of a bad way? If the answer is yes or close to yes, you have your answer. You want to disclose it. So uh, let me give you two examples. We're, we're keeping this brief today. We'll be done by 4 o'clock, so we're going to, no, I'm kidding, just like another 45 minutes or so. Uh, let's say I'm uh, doing my visual inspection. I'm, this is a, like the second floor of a house hallway here. I'm going up and down the hallway, and I've got the habit of going to bedrooms, bathrooms, doing my little visual inspection thing, making little notes or disclosures. But I notice as I traverse the hallway back and forth that it seems to be slightly, not a lot, but slightly sloped a little bit. And so I'm wondering, you know, I'm just there by myself thinking about it, I'm wondering, well, this could be a problem, and it could be an expensive one to fix, or indication of a problem. Uh, it could be a structural issue, uh, soils problem, construction defect issue. All of those would be expensive to repair, incredibly expensive to litigate over and repair. Well, I'm already thinking in the wrong direction, and it's a, it's a bad habit to, be in, to think in that direction, because I'm, even though I'm not talking to anybody, I'm there by myself, I'm sort of <laughs> trying to figure things out a little bit. And one of the good things about disclosure and there aren't a lot of great things about it, by the way. But one good thing about it is we never need to figure anything out. We don't want to figure things out. We want, don't want to analyze or diagnose or explain. Uh, and let me just give you two quick examples. If, there, if this was like a dining room, dining room table, and I'm doing my visual inspection, I look up and I see a small water stain in the, stain, uh, in the ceiling. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. That's first impression, just small water stain. Well, I'm sure that you know, and you don't need me to remind you necessarily, but I will. You never want to use adjectives with disclosure. So small, big, major, minor, fair, poor, colors, numbers, just never use adjectives. They're still, they are still the number one problem we have with litigation issues in real estate agents is the use of adjectives. And it's really basic, but it's, it's really easy to use them without really thinking about it. Because you might say, all right, I don't want to say small, so I'm going to get rid of that. I don't want to argue in court with somebody whether the stain is small or medium or large or extra large and all, and they'll argue with me over that. But I also, of course, want to take out the word water because water is an adjective there in that sentence or that disclosure. Because if I say it's a water stain, even though in normal life it doesn't really mean anything, it probably is. But in the fantasy land of the courtroom, I'm making an analysis and I'm not supposed to analyze because if it's a water stain, it's got to be coming from, what, a roof leak, plumbing leak, AC line dripping. It doesn't have to be any of those things. It could be from something stored in the attic. Uh, it could be from dining room, bottle of champagne, somebody popped a cork at the ceiling. Don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. And if I knew what it was from, I still wouldn't be putting anything about that down on the AVID. Sometimes an agent will say, well, I got the listing. I've known the sellers for years. I know what happened here. You may think you know what happened, but it takes about 60 seconds in court for an aggressive attorney to convince you and everybody else that you don't know, because they will eventually get you to say, well, that's what I was told. Oh, so you don't really know for sure. No, I've been friends with the sellers forever, but you don't really know. You have been given a story. So unless you were right there, and even if you were right there looking at the thing, it still would be problematic to write it down. So small water stain, is what it looks like, but when I write it down on the AVID, it's going to be just generic, like stain, spot, discoloration, something like that. So I want to relieve myself of the burden of trying to figure things out, and it coming back to the floor that seems like it's slightly off, I don't have to think about the structural and the, the soils, and all I gotta do is mention it on the AVID, but before I do, I look at the hallway, and I visually cannot see that really minor little slope. But I do, I notice it when I'm walking back and forth, but I don't see it. I can't visually pick up on it. I wouldn't say, well, the TDS is visual inspection. Can't see it. Uh, I'm not going to tell them. No, still let them know. Because the buyers will notice it when they move in, and they'll probably be caught off guard and maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit surprised, maybe negatively surprised. So upstairs hallway floor appears to have some unevenness or something like that. I don't want to filter out what I write down based on my inability to visually pick up on it. Same thing with the very strong odor in the home. Let's say I have the buyers. Every time I go to the property, it hits me like a wall. There's a very strong, pervasive smell in the home, and I'm wondering, you know, like most of us would, like, what is this coming from? 
It's not a good question to ask, even, even just in your head, let alone out loud, mm -hmm. because it doesn't make any difference what it's coming from. I'm not going to write that down anyway. And if I think I know what the source is, that's problematic because I don't know. They'll prove it in court and again, 60 seconds that I don't know. Uh, and I don't want to get into litigious terminology like pet odors, cat, dog, parakeet, or whatever the animal is, or critter is, um, tobacco. What if there's like a musty smell in the home? I, never, I know we never have humid weather here, but mm -hmm. if we did. Or, or did they just have a lot of plants or watering? It's just like, you can tell it's just musty in the, in the room. Well, I don't want to write that down because musty is related to mildew and that's related to mold. So I'm making a professional analysis uh, explanation there when I write down musty. And I will not win the battle in court. I will be doing battle with an expert witness um, moldologist, I'm not sure what they're called, but whatever they're <laughs> called. This guy will say, I've written books on mold, I'm the, ex I'm the world's expert. I, I cannot pick up a, a smell or an odor in a home and determine if it's in the mold family. Now, really can, but that's what they'll say. I can't wait to find out how the real estate agent has this incredible ability that I've never even heard of. And you're in a position to have to get up on the stand and explain this, and you just don't want to go through that. You won't win the battle. So. I do want to disclose it because it's a sensory perception, it's sense of smell. But the question comes up, what do you actually write down? You know, the house stinks. I'm not going to write that down. So, <laughs> so what do you write down? Something I have in the notes, you may like this, you may come up with something better, which is fine. I like the word obvious or apparent. Obvious, order noted a property, or in garage, or you know, wherever you notice it. It calls attention to that issue, but I'm not designating anything as the source or explaining anything or whatever. And, and back to that musty mildew thing, uh, if you see like spots on a kitchen wall or something, and it's clearly, I mean, if it was in your own, own home, you'd say that's mildew, I'll get some kind of a cleanser and a sponge and I'll wipe it down. Well, you can't, you know, that, that's regular life, but in real estate, you know, you could just refer to them again generically as spots or stains or discoloration marks or whatever. Just stay away from anything that's in the mold family, especially um, among other things. So, anyway, uh, two examples. So, any sense of any any sensory perception, it doesn't really make any difference. Which one? So, the only two things that should ever appear on an avid, you probably think you already know this, and maybe you do. You probably do, but there's a, I'll throw out a couple of challenges here. Everything you write down must be either a a defect or a red flag. And by way of definition, we'll simply a defect is obviously something that is uh, broken, uh, busted, doesn't work. There's no, expl there's no explanation necessary or there's no analysis that's being given when you write down the broken window. If this was like the dining room and the window's broken, I can say it's a cracked window. I, I have a conclusion, it's, it's, it's a broken window. There is no like window expert that will challenge me on that. So it's, it's, it's an, that's the easy category. The one that's a little bit more mysterious, so to speak, is the red flag category. And that's when there is an indication of something that might be wrong, but I really don't know, like if it's a stain like this, if, if the source of the leak has been fixed a long time ago or there was a, an attempted repair that's not gonna last very long. So I, I have some question in my mind. So whenever there is a concern but not a conclusion that puts it in the red flag category. Now, so those are the only two things we have to write down or we should write down. Now, a lot of red flags are not really problems, but we still have to document them. For example, if you were to see this, you would be concerned, <laughs> uh, but not now, it's just a dog. So let me tell you the story on this. I was going over it yesterday in Northridge and a lot of the pictures that I show, I, I actually, take them, you know, myself. This one, these two I did not. And you might have seen this on the internet. It's a true story. I've checked it out on like Snopes.com and all these urban legend websites. This is taken in, in the picture's taken in India where lions are like a factor of life <laughs> there. And it's an industrial facility. The owner was having a lot of nighttime burglaries and he had this watchdog that wasn't, wasn't doing much good apparently. So he went to Supercuts or somewhere and gave it a trim. So I'm thinking, as long as the thief does not make eye contact with this animal, we're okay. But it kind of, <laughs> kind of blows his cover with, uh, with a glance. Anyway, okay, red flag, no problem. So here are the two traps we can fall into that we really have to be careful about. 
uh, the first one I'll just call it the, the ceiling fan trap, and that is, let's say this is the uh, family room, and uh, I can't find anything to mention. It, it looks fine. I don't want to complement the room, just like I don't want to complement the house in disclosure. I can in advertising, not in disclosure. Sometimes when an agent can't find anything wrong anywhere, which I'll get to in a second, uh, it shouldn't happen very often, but it can happen, and it does. Uh, they will, at the very end of the avid, just put a comment down like, home is in fair condition, because that's what it looks like to them. But that's a compliment to the property, and we never, ever compliment the property we never say anything positive about it on a disclosure document. If you were going to go on a, let's say our weather wasn't so dreadful this week, and this uh, Saturday you were going to go on a picnic, and you watch the news on Friday night, get the weather, and they say we're going to have fair weather tomorrow, that would be, that would mean good weather. So we never want to say anything is good or excellent or wonderful or beautiful or whatever on a disclosure form. Even normal wear and tear is a problem because normal in court means good. So we don't want to go in that direction. But I happen to notice in the family room before I leave and have nothing to say, and I don't want to leave a blank either because it looks like I forgot to go there or something or forgot to go to that room. I notice that there's a ceiling fan. I think, good, I've got something to write down. Ceiling fan. Well, a ceiling fan is not a defect and it's not a red flag, so it doesn't belong on the form. It's inventory. So what I've just done is I've diverted a little bit in my purpose there, in my visual inspection, to also encompass the listing of inventory. And now to be consistent, I need to take inventory in every other room that I'm about to go to and all the rooms I've been through already. And I have a two-page addendum with a list of all the stuff they have there. And I don't want to do that. So we've got to be careful about that. The other one is the, what I call the spider web trap. Uh, exaggerating a little bit, but I can't find anything to mention. So I start getting incredibly picky. Let's say the sellers had a, uh, or the TV is here, they had a, like a painting or something in the wall. They moved out and there's a little tiny hole uh, where they, you know, they had a nail or a screw. And by the way, I don't want to call that a nail hole unless I see a nail. Nail is an adjective. I have seen an agent spend two hours on the stand because of the use of the word nail. The sellers had like 15 pictures on their wall, and they moved out. Look, like somebody got a machine gun and you know all these little <laughs> holes. And the agent referred to them as nail holes, and to make them look bad, you know, he, that, not that there's anything terribly wrong with that disclosure, but just to make them look bad for other aspects of the case. The opposing attorney asked him, "How many nails did you see when you made that disclosure?" So I didn't see any. The sellers had a lot of pictures, paintings. They moved out and saw the nail holes. And the attorney wanting to make it combative and to get the guy upset said, you know, you haven't answered my question yet. I'll try again. How many nails did you see? Give me an answer. So I didn't see any. I said, okay, well, could the pictures and stuff been hung up there by screws and not nails? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. I said, well, you didn't see those either, did you? So during the deal, during the transaction, when you were doing your visual inspection, you wrote down nail holes. Now that you're in court under oath, you're telling us you never saw any nails. So were you lying then or you're lying now? <laughs> and it's just a, just a terrible, dreadful place to be, you know, experience to go through. Don't use adjectives. Nail's an adjective there, so be careful about it. But anyway, little tiny hole, and I'm thinking, well, I'll mention that because I can't find anything else. It's, it's too minor. It, it's below my radar screen of disclosure. Now I've, I've gone so low down in terms of the trivia, the minutia of the home, to be consistent, I need to do that for every other room I'm about to go through and all the rooms I've already been through. And now I've got another two-page addendum, in addition to the inventory, of all the minutia in the room, in the house. So unless you have an office policy to the contrary, uh, nothing noted is a great thing to write down if you just can't find anything to say. You don't want to leave a blank, and you don't want to make up something. Now, we were talking yesterday about how it is good to like demonstrate that you were really there rather than nothing noted, nothing noted, nothing noted, which might be the temptation if it's in really great shape. And you don't want to say great shape either, by the way. So, you know, since the home's going to be in California and it probably has a driveway and it's probably a cement or concrete driveway, you know, every driveway has got cracks somewhere. Most of the homes here have like a, like a stucco, you don't want to use the word stucco, but like a, a hard, hard type exterior. Um, backyard patios, pools, there's going to be cracks. And the word some works really good here. It's an optional word, but it works nicely. Some cracks noted in the driveway, in the rear patio, and some of this, something in the laundry room. Come up with a few things that are minor, 
but it's not a room to room to room every single thing you're getting something to just have some things in the disclosure that just indicate that you were there that nobody's going to get upset about and nobody needs to do anything about so a couple tips on that so be careful of to keep it with the red flags and uh defects let me give you a real life example back to these what look like in real life but we don't want to write this down what look like mildew stains let's say and it could be bathroom kitchen it could be anywhere so here's a technique that works really well it's free of charge to use you do not, do not have to download an app to to use it, it takes about 30 seconds and um, it's a little old-fashioned because you might be not using a checkbook or looking at the Reader's Digest but you might be looking taking a pen and writing down something on a piece of paper so I see this at the property and I, well, I better disclose something well, when I notice the crack window, I can, with my ink pen, go on the avenue and write it down. I will never change that. It's a broken window. I, there's no, I will never need to change that disclosure. But this one's gonna take a few more words than just broken window. So on my little notepad, I write down whatever comes to mind, exaggerating a bit to make a point. And I have two small black mold stains noted. Then later on in my car, in my office, here, wherever you are, take it out and look at it and say, what? words can I take out of this sentence such that it still grammatically makes sense in the English language? I would never want to use numbers, small as an adjective, don't want to use colors, positively don't want to write down the word mold, and the only thing I have left over is stains noted and I write that down with my pen on the app. It took me a half a minute and I've taken what might have been a problematic liability prone disclosure statement and turned it into something that's about as liability free as I can get. So that's a good technique. By the way, as I race through this stuff, if you have any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand. We had a couple questions last time. So let me do a real practical, <coughs> real life example. A couple months ago, I was at a Vons supermarket, middle of the day, I was in a hurry like I usually am, and um, I wanted to use the express line, so I looked at the cart, I had 14 items. So I qualify, I guess. So I put them up on the counter. I noticed the guy behind me was like counting, he was like, <laughs> so I'm thinking, well, I looked at 14, like what, if I had had 16, 17, 18, uh, nothing would have happened, I don't think, but you know, I mean, that, that's supermarket life, that's not real, real estate things, things happen. Well, about a week later, I was at a Ralph's and I noticed that they wrote it down differently, very cleverly, about 15 items. <laughs> Same scenario with my 14 things, if that guy was behind me here, he wouldn't be counting. Because he looked, it's about 15 items. It might be 16, 17, 18, but that's still about 15. It like takes the dispute out of it. It takes the argument out of it. And that's the way we want to do it in disclosure. We want to do our fiduciary obligation job for our client and let them know something that we've observed as part of our limited visual inspection. But we don't want to set ourselves up for a dispute or an argument. So we want to like have the happy medium thing going. So Instead of writing down two cracks noted in the living room at North Wall and three cracks at South Wall and have all kinds of arguments, are there two, are there three, are there four, is that North Wall really the Northeast Wall and all this stuff, I just use the about 15 items approach. Some cracks noted at living room, wall, living room walls, there's no, nothing to argue about. If I say two, they may find a third. I, I just found crack number three, you know, get over here. I don't want to have that call. <laughs> And they, before they, when they find crack number three, and before they call me, hopefully they'll look at the ad in the book. Some cracks noted, oh, well that's one of the some, and never hear about it. And they don't talk to an attorney about it, just a better, better way to go. Okay, um, we talked about this yesterday as well. Uh, buyers maybe make a fairly quick buying decision, maybe they're from out of the area, visit once, look at a home, like, look at several homes, like a particular one, make an offer, and then after they move in, they, they say to themselves, you know, we never really, we didn't really notice when we were here the first time making our buying decision that we back up to a busy street or there's a railroad track nearby, um, a Walmart's nearby or something, a, a school, something that could be a nuisance factor, shopping center, whatever. So we have to let them know if there's something unusual in ter terms of mainly like a noise or a nuisance factor. You know, for agents that do business in the city of San Francisco, I mean right in the city, there's no disclosure at all about urban noise, like cable cars and 
uh, bells ringing and uh, sirens and traffic and because if you're buying a home in San Francisco like if you were buying one in New York City that's just a given you're going to have a problem you're going to have issues like that maybe not problems but when you get into the more residential type settings if there's anything that might catch them off guard we didn't really realize this and it's a good idea to have a disclosure now if, the, if you got the house here and it's the closest residence to a Walmart so if you're in the front yard you can see the Walmart right there and the buyers have been to the property a couple of times in their buying decision process think well it would be an insult to their intelligence to mention that the Walmart's there that they've seen it a few times uh, it still needs to be disclosed for example if you were showing a condo here and the buyers have been to it a few times you might think I don't really have to mention this railroad thing because it's like right there we still have to mention it we have to be careful how we mention it which we'll get to in a minute but you might think well what do buyers say when they're challenged on this in court and there's something so obvious and somebody asks them well how did how did you miss this well uh, the problem is uh, they have an attorney and some of the attorneys are clever in kind of a bad way a deceptive way and before that they go to court the attorney will meet with the buyer and say by the way they're going to ask you right out loud the judge will ask you somebody will ask you how did you miss this thing I mean you're right there so let's make sure we're on the same page here an example this happened up in Roseville near uh, Sacramento older guy buyer from out of state one visit to the property made a buying decision off of that one visit uh, I kind of think he was doing this at least partially for the money so that that was a factor he had told his agent that he would like to live near a park and on move-in day second time he had seen the property he pulls up he says there's a cemetery behind my house well it's a memorial park I guess it's a different kind of park than he was looking for but anyway <laughs> it's like 10 acres big I mean it's right there it's whole flat you can see it backyard little chain link fence and he was in the backyard there were witnesses said he was in the backyard so he sued because he was not told about that so you know court uh, you know lawsuit court time and uh, bench trial meaning no jury just the judge is making the decision so he was asked the judge asked him we know you were in the backyard we have several witnesses that we could bring forward to, to testify to that fact how did you miss the uh, how did you not see that that uh, cemetery his answer all rehearsed was your honor I left my glasses at home <coughs> I have a prescription pair I didn't want to go buy a new prescription pair I can only see like 10 feet in front of me you can see it now we're thinking you've got to be kidding but the jury's like when there is a jury they're like oh yeah that's just too bad it's like mm -hmm. really uh, and uh, so um he won he got 70 some thousand dollars for this oh in order not to try to rescind the contract and all that so no matter how obvious something is you got to disclose it so if there are train tracks near the home let's say not this close necessarily but you know backyard you can sort of see it I think, well maybe I'll disclose I'm just thinking how would I disclose this I might say buyers are advised that there may be a noise issue with the nearby train now, that sounds pretty good it's probably the most common disclosure for a close by railroad the problem is is that I'm only mentioning one thing that might bother them about living that close to an active railroad meaning there's now lots of things they can sue me over they can sue me over the shaking of the house, the quivering of the walls, which they say, they will say they never had any idea what happened, and, and it happens four times a day, and we always think there's gonna be an earthquake, and you know they've got a therapist in, 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 the, in, in the front row, and maybe violins playing in the background or something. And uh, well, let's see, they could sue over child safety concerns, fear of derailment, diesel fumes, toxic materials being transported, the train whistle or what they call it all kinds of things so I can't start a list and when I mention the noise I've started a list and you can never make a disclosure list long enough so the better disclosure is to tell them what's there not what might bother them about what's there buyers are advised that there is a train next to the house close to the house near the house don't get caught up in the close near how far it's all kind of treated the same and then anything and everything that could possibly bother them about living that close to a active rail line is covered in that disclosure it's kind of like um, where I live there's a problem in parts of the area where they're near 
like some trails, uh, you know, uh, uh, hillside trails where we have a coyote problem, especially at night. If you have a pet, it's considered a temporary pet. <laughs> if it's a small like cat or dog, and if it's outside at night without a leash or not fenced in, it will last about two days. They've got about 48 hours to live and they are gone. They just disappear. So uh, a neighbor of mine, who should have talked to me first but didn't, uh, had his home on the market and buyer came, actually met the buyer at, you know, when the buyers were looking at it and found out that the buyers have a, had a small dog, you know, a little dog. And so as a favor, it was a nice guy thing, the seller wrote, uh, I think, an email to his agent that went on to the buyer's agent, please let the buyers know, since they have a small dog, that we have a problem with coyotes and you know, keep the dog in at night and all that. So it sounds like a nice thing to do. But notice that the sellers, without really thinking about it, were creating a list of things in the animal kingdom, let's say, that might be a problem. And they only mentioned one critter, and that was coyotes. So first day in the property, Mr. Buyer has his little dog on a leash during the day, walking down one of the trails, and a rattlesnake comes out of a bush and bites the dog. Uh, $1,800 vet bill to keep the dog alive. The sellers sued, excuse me, the buyers sued the sellers. You told us about, you know, we're from out of state. We've never even seen a coyote and certainly have never seen a rattlesnake. You told us about the coyote, so we're, I was looking for him. I was looking around, you know, for coyotes. The snake came out and bit my dog, you know, a poisonous snake. And you didn't tell me about the snakes. I think, okay, do it over again. Mention the coyotes and the rattlesnakes. Are we done? No. We're never done. Never done. Scorpions, I don't know, black widow spiders, uh, poison oak, poison ivy, you can get into, just go on and on. Uh, uh, in Pasadena, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, there's some agents that live in the, I think it's Sierra Madre district of Pasadena, and they have a, a bear problem. They certainly do up in like Lake Arrowhead and Big Bear. And so, so you think, well, and by the way, so you can, can't make a list, just don't make a list. To just get off of the wildlife thing, which I usually actually don't talk about, I do have something in the notes about it, if you're doing, dealing with a property where it's an issue, and uh, are invasive and indigenous wildlife species in this area that may be of concern. That covers everything sent to the dinosaur age. If it is alive, it's either invasive, it somehow got here some way, or it's indigenous, it's always been here. And they've been warned, and they can check it out if they want to. But you don't want to start a list. So one more example on the the, yes, go ahead. Just real quick, regarding the train or the freeway, that's a mention on the SBQ, the Solar Property right, Commissioner, right. and there's a space for an explanation regarding that remark. Yes. Right. Is that something that you would want to still include on the Avid, even though it's already part of the SBQ? Yeah, okay, it's already on the other form. So good question. Uh, I have no idea. Anyway, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, if it's, it, that is, it's good that it's there. And like, I know like in the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area, they have like a regional disclosure where there's a, it's a special disclosure about golf courses and so forth, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, and you know, in Palos Verdes, they have a, every place has got some kind of unique things. In Palos, Rancho Palos Verdes, whatever, they got different names for this place, uh, you know, near Torrance, they have a really big problem. Anybody know what the problem is there? Wild peacocks. They're all over the place. I, I, no place else I go. They're all, an agent, I did a seminar for a, a Remax company there, and they, they said, an agent said, I live in Palos Verdes, Verdes. I had, one morning I had counted 31 peacocks on my row. Wow. They're beautiful to look at, uh, but they're a real nuisance, and they're a protected species, and there was a situation where buyers moved in, were not told about the wild peacocks, which they should have been told about, and Mr. Buyer goes out to his car in the morning, first time, there's two peacocks on the roof of his car. He said, you know, first of all, like, my gosh, look at these big, huge birds. That was the first surprise. Then he's like trying to shoo them away, and they get into this like aggressive stance, and they can be really mean, you know? <laughs> you see, he goes, oh, well, I don't want to mess with you guys. So he, he got a garden hose, and he's spraying them down, and a neighbor said, you know, nice to meet you. By the way, it's against the law. No, I'll do that. Another neighbor called the police. Wow. $1,500 fine wow. for messing with the peacocks. Now, of course, his, he sued and all that, and we have a small claims court, but he got reimbursed and all that. So 
if it's something that's unique to an area and there's a separate disclosure, that's always good. And with the form you're talking about, it's on there and it's good. But if it's, it doesn't hurt. It's kind of like, should I disclose it? As Mike was saying, yeah, go go ahead. You know, if it's, if there, if like this building over here was a school, I would, and the the house is here. No matter what form it's, it addresses it, I would mention that there's a school nearby. Now, I'm not going to say that there's gridlock in the morning and the afternoon when the kids are being dropped off and picked up and you can't get out of your driveway. And I'm not going to mention the noise from the uh, it's a high school and the, the bands that play there on uh, the dance on Saturday night. I'm not going to mention the noise from the soccer games. There's, I can't make a list. There are too many things. If there was a church there, I don't want to mention gridlock maybe on Sunday and every hour they ring chimes and at 12 noon they have battle hymn of the republic for 45 minutes or something <laughs> there's too many things all I got to do is say there's a church near the home or a school so I'd still mention something uh, so the golf course the what's that how would you well the it, about the, the question is how would you disclose the peacocks well in that area they have a special form that almost everybody in the business uses, which is a little blurb about 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 wild peacocks, and th and that takes care of it because it's really unique. So when I do something like a, an association of realtors, I will often often bring this picture and I'll ask everybody. So like, what um, what would be a common disclosure for any seller here? Almost everybody says errant golf balls. That's a you know very it could be a lot of things, but that's what comes up usually. So we do this little workshop thing that takes a half hour, but I'll do it in about three minutes here. So we start out with one or two golf balls a week hit, hit the house, because that's what maybe an, a neighbor told us or we heard it from somebody. I think, well, that's not good, so I've got to you know, modify this. I, I don't want to argue with somebody who's moved in, the buyers have moved in. They said, well, there really isn't one or two. It's more like four or five. We've been counting them, and it's not a week. It's like every, every day, every other day. So I think, well, I want to remove that argument potential completely by not even having it in my disclosure so it doesn't get up on the screen in court. So occasionally is a better word. It's a kind of a ambiguous word. It's hard to really define. And so that's okay, but I think, well, you, go, you can go crazy on these things and just keep going. But I think, well, I'll just get rid of it. Why, why even have it? Why do I want to go on the stand and say, have an attorney say, we want you to define the word occasionally. You have 45 minutes go and you think well, I don't I don't I don't want to have that experience so I just take it out in advance so we're almost done golf balls hit the house one more step because we could you know again go nuts on this stuff but uh, maybe the balls are hitting a nice uh, new uh, BMW or something in the driveway not just the house so we finish up with golf balls hit the property so that's pretty good except I've started a list again I've mentioned only one thing that could bother somebody about being that close to a golf course. There's lots of things that could bother them. So the buyers move in and they say, you know, we absolutely love these free golf balls. It's like an Easter egg hunt every weekend. We get a basket and pluck them out of the garden. What drives us crazy that nobody told us about is about 5 o'clock in the morning, the lawnmower crew, the landscape, the tractors, all that machinery starts up and it's just ruining our lifestyle and it's horrible. Now in real life you'd say, here's your house, there's a golf course, it's got grass, this, this is what happens. But can't do that in court you know so it's like the buyers could never figure this out so um, a better disclosure is golf course is adjacent to property and then all the things that could bother them about being that close they're taken care of home is near a busy street home is next to a freeway something you know whatever you don't want to get into all the detail just uh, maybe one more thing here and we'll wrap it up any questions before we just about draw the question. If Carolyn with First American NHG comes in, I'll, I'll uh, point her out and she can say something. Let me talk about building permits. You, you, are, you have a suspicion, <coughs> at least, if not more, that part of the property has been added on to it illegally. I know that doesn't happen around here, yeah. but you just in case it didn't. And how involved do you get? Well, you know, companies have different policies. There are regional differences. There are places I will go in California where when I ask everybody, do you check for building permits, they are yelling out no before I even finish the question. Like, no way, nothing. Others, it's yes. Uh, others, it's a case-by-case -case basis. The, the point I want to make is that it's, you're on really dangerous ground when you get in any way involved with that process. Now, there are maybe times that you do, 
and you can construct disclosures that that will be good and protect you you just have to be careful about it because it's a it can be a really high cost kind of a, of, a, of an issue uh, in the notes I have um, this and I'll, I'll read it but don't uh, you don't have to write it down buyers are advised to check with the local municipality regarding building permit information it and local, local municipality is better than city of because in a lot of areas like I mentioned I was in Pasadena a week or two ago I just asked everybody there most of whom live or work around there said are there homes that have a Pasadena California mailing address that are not in the city of Pasadena and everybody they always say yes uh, like a little fringe unincorporated area well uh, you don't want to recommend that those buyers go to the city of Pasadena for building permit information because the city won't have it it's not in the city they'll need to go to the county of Los, An Los Angeles County so rather than guess at it unless it's just really crystal clear local municipality is a safer expression than city of in case that city doesn't process of permits and some cities share with another city or they they contract with another city to do it it gets kind of a mess all over California but um, let me just back up here for a second uh, generally speaking have little to do with it or just be very careful and have special wording to reaffirm that the burden is really on the buyers uh, not on you to do the permit stuff and the permit investigation I, I mentioned yesterday there was a case in um, I think it was in Redlands in the Inland Empire anyway but so I think it was Redlands where buyers had moved were from out of state they were closing escrow in that area in about a week so they moved to town they, you know they were done with their house for for about a week at a hotel in the Redlands area and they had some time on their hands and they called their agent up so you know we never have really gotten fully settled on this family room addition thing and we have some time we know that you don't really want to get involved with this but we don't have a car with us would you mind picking us up uh, taking us to the building permit uh, facility whatever and you can wait in the car you don't have to get out and we'll just do our thing and we'll go to lunch or something so that's that's what the agent did <clears throat> and what happened was they went into the agent pulled up at City Hall sat in the car buyers went in they went up to some clerk and like here's our address mm -hmm. and they say they said in court they didn't really get much help and they went down the hallway and they just got flustered got it was all dead ends and just took between the two of them just said let's forget it let's just go to lunch and and whatever so they moved in you know neighbors are ever so helpful to come over <laughs> start yapping away so neighbors came and nice to meet you welcome to the neighborhood by the way you know that uh, family room is an illegal addition and they were trying to con they were going to convert and partially converted the garage to a bedroom and the buyers thought it was a bedroom it was like dressed out it was even staged like a bedroom which is another problem and the buyers made a well that was bad enough the buyers made a, a kind of a uh, innocent mistake they called up the city and asked that a city inspector come out and look at it so the inspector comes out and says yeah that's against that's illegal that's not right and then the the hot tub in the, in the backyard that's all unpermitted and you know eighty five thousand dollars which became a little bit more than that over time and repairs needed or modifications to get everything permitted so it was a bench trial meaning again no jury mr buyers on the stand and the judge asked him why didn't you uh do some building permit research before you closed escrow and mr buyer said well we did kind of late in the game but we did oh we went to city hall in Redlands, Redlands City Hall, and they couldn't help us. It was like a dead end. We just didn't get any help. So the judge said, well, you know, in the city of Redlands, building permits are not at City Hall. They're about four blocks away at another city building, like their building department. <coughs> Why'd you go to City Hall? Answer? That's where our agent drove us. We're from, you know, we're from Kentucky or somewhere. We don't know. We were just at a hotel. We said, take us there. And that's where we were taken. The agent sat in the car, but we went in the building, and it was wrong, apparently the wrong place. Guess who paid the claim? Oh. It wasn't the sellers that did all this illegal stuff and didn't disclose it right. It wasn't the buyers who kind of fumbled on it. It was the buyer's agent who literally picked him up at the Holiday Inn, drove two miles to City Hall, and just sat there in the car. So it does not make my, my main point here is it doesn't take much for 
uh, you to be in the liability loop. So just have to be careful about it. I'll just mention one other thing. Uh, can I just do one more item? It'll just take a second. Yeah, and then okay. I got a couple. Okay, yeah. Uh, let me talk about something nobody's asked me about in 29 years until recently, and that's marijuana. And the question is, uh, I'm doing my visual inspection, I cut through the backyard, and uh, there's, uh, there's a marijuana plant there. Do I need to disclose it? Now, there is some variance with companies on this, and I, many of you probably know who Gov Hutchison is, and he and I did an event together in Sacramento at the end of last year, and he was going over an exception to the rule. This is where they have three acres. It's a marijuana farm. It's a production facility. Well, that, that's obviously a disclosure issue. I'm talking about just the random plant. Generally, the, the answer would be no, there'd be no disclosure because plants out in the garden or whatever are not part of our standard of care. And so you think, well, uh, if I'm going to extend it to the backyard, uh, let's see, there's oleander bushes or whatever that are poisonous, so I better mention those. And the rose bushes have thorns, and there's maybe poison oak, poison ivy. Some agents, again, expand from, from the garden to the animal kingdom, and we're getting in, as I mentioned, to the coyotes and the rattlesnakes and the, the, all the other things, and our, our, our standard of care just keeps expanding. Well, we want to keep it just a limited visual inspection uh, of the home, and if we get into the garden and all that, and the plants and marijuana, we're getting into identifying plants, so usually there's no disclosure for that kind of thing, that kind of, uh, of uh, situation. So anyway, my time is up, and I'll turn it back over to Mike. If you ever have any questions on disclosure, when you get the notes, I do a lot of driving, and uh, this, there's no charge for this. You can call me up any time as I'm buzzing along, and uh, if you have a question about disclosure, I'll try to answer it. Okay, thank you. So I did. I tried to do this yesterday, but it's going to be a lot more fun for me today. In Northridge, where I've never even been until we opened an office there, I don't know a lot of things about the area, right? It's scary to even sell down there. But I want to make. I want to point out a couple things that are very real to you guys, and I want you to consider these things. Um, big lawsuits going on all the time that I get to hear about from the, all the emails going back and forth between the brokers and management. I'll start with behind us here. So Copper Hill runs up, right? On the left side is the gated community of West Hills. We have West Creek, all the way to beautiful Tesoro. So since they started these projects, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, I'll tell you about some of the lawsuits that have come up that you don't think about. You think, this is Valencia. They're tracked homes. They're beautiful. Nothing really to disclose. So the first couple of lawsuits that started coming out was Tesoro, their Melarus was pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. um, the lawsuits that started coming out where the agents were disclosing home is in a Melarus area. Agents got sued, and this goes all over the place, but agents got sued left and right by saying, hey, listen, you pointed out the Melarus, but you didn't point out the library bond, the school bonds, things like that, that were separate, not considered Melarus. So that was a big deal. The second thing was that I really remember the most of the lawsuits is our economy crashed and Newhall Land decided to not sell any of their land, right? So they sold, the builders sold all these homes as a gated community. Do you guys remember how long those gates were open? Correct. 10 open. years, right? There was tons of lawsuits against the builders for that. Uh, not only that, they took 10 years to start building it. So lawsuits started happening. Now these people that are all settled for 10 years are now dealing with mud, noise, signs, um, looky-loos, people looking at all the models. That was huge. And I'm like, man, we can't win as real estate agents, right? We just can't. We have to really, really think about some of these things. The next thing that was the most mind-blowing thing ever to me was these beautiful, yuppie Valencia homeowners move into these beautiful gated neighborhoods, none of them considered walking on top of the hills behind them. You guys know what's directly on the other side of the hills from them? Yeah. Wayside. Maximum security prison. Yeah. <laughs> Thousands of people are now in the line. You know, when they escape, they typically go south. We've proven that, right? <laughs> so they escape, they go over the hill, right through those neighborhoods. Imagine the lawsuits that came uh, that are still going because of that. So I'm like, my gosh, I mean, we, we have no chance as real estate agents. So we really got to think about these things. 
So our Santa Clarita disclosure, which we love, there's those things have come about from all of us brokers getting together and saying, hey, let's all throw our lawsuits in a pat and let's <laughs> talk about some of these things. It goes back as far as uh, my favorite one that I just heard about a couple months ago is an agent at, um, I think it was Realty Executive, sold a home to somebody in Tesoro. Even in the, in the houses that are up by the HOA, the little detached Canterbury's, so what happened was, is the, they moved in, they lived there a couple of years, somehow, some way, they got a hold of knowledge that in 1920 or whatever, that St. Francis Dam broke right. and destroyed all life through the entire San Francisco mm. Canyon, all the way down through the 126. I'm sure they were going after money too, but they said, the agent never disclosed we're in a flood zone. Now, how long has that dam been broken? Yeah. 100 years, and they're still trying to sue, so I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I'll give you one more example, and this is probably the best one I can come up with, to open up your minds to disclosures. So I moved into Placerita Canyon in the year 2000. I've always wanted to live in Placerita Canyon since seventh grade. I didn't care about anything. The one thing that I noticed that was a trip was on the NHD that Carolyn gave me was I was in a liquefaction zone. You guys know what that is? Yes. When there's an earthquake, the house sinks, and that's just the way it is. So I'm like, well, that's pretty trippy, and I almost considered not buying there because of that. So as I lived there over the years, if I ever wanted to sue the homeowners, let me give you a list of things that I've learned. Recently, we learned that there's three 30-foot wide gas pipes that run under the entire neighborhood. If you guys know what happened in uh, Porter Ranch, Porter Ranch mm -hmm. we can have that too, Yeah. right? That was never disclosed. I mean, these things are running under the entire neighborhood, which is mind blowing. Like to have that kind of something not disclosed. Right. At the top of the hill right behind my house is the hub where these huge pipes of gas come everywhere. Mm -hmm. If I was a terrorist and wanted to bomb LA, that's where I'd go first. <laughs> Right? So then we have the wash that runs through my property. It is controlled by governmental agencies that I had never even really thought about, like the Army Corps of Engineers. There's certain things you can and can't do. We do have evidence of the stickleback fish in there, all kinds of stuff. I don't know if I own it, if I don't own it, can I build a bridge over it? Can I put a seawall up? You know, because there was times where El Nino came and took out 50 feet of my property. So there's another lawsuit, right? Then when I moved in, they disclosed to me there was no homeowners association. I found out there's two. I'm on the board of one today. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so what they meant to say was there's no HOA dues for that association. But what I found out when I moved in, there's a gate at one side, right? Yeah. It's 300 bucks a year per car to be able to drive in and out of it, which I wasn't disclosed to. We have four cars in the family, you know, four drivers. And then uh, to make that worse, there is an HOA that actually can govern, and it's one of the most powerful HOAs in the entire Santa Clarita Valley. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So there's another thing. What else? Now we find out that the train breaks down all the time, and you can't get out of the neighborhood. And if you don't have a gate card to get out the other side, you can't get out. There's that. There's, uh, oh, the other neighbor, one of the neighbors that's actually going through a lawsuit right now, um, the, the agent didn't disclose that it's in a um, flood zone and a fire zone. So two things happened last year. They couldn't get their horses out during the flood, and they couldn't get their horses out during the fire when we had our evacuation. Can two more things. The NHD, where you're located in a if you read zone. it, right? But the agents and the companies are supposed to know about these things. So a neighborhood that seems so innocent has all these things that never ends. I mean, there's, there's churches, right? There's three churches in the neighborhood. When the churches get out all at the same time for whatever reason, you can't get out of my neighborhood. There's a line a mile long of cars. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So as an agent, I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, I could yeah. be a billionaire if yeah. I wanted to sue for all these things. So keep a very open mind with disclosure and do your due diligence, right? We don't want to write things down like Robert says not to, but it's absolutely crucial. And that's why when you guys are doing your AVIDs, when you're doing your TDSs, when you're doing general disclosure, do not forget the Santa Clarita disclosure, right? That discloses the jails, wind, I mean, the weirdest things ever. If you read that, the, um, <laughs> that's the other one. Oh, Burmite, the hillsides of Burmite run down into my neighborhood, right? The most toxic polluted area in all of Santa Clarita. <laughs> I'm like, what else is gonna happen? <laughs> There's all, oh, and the oil fields. 
could blow, right? I mean, you guys all know where the oil fields are. Can you see this list of disclosures that I was not provided? So these are the types of things that I want you guys to consider. Um, disclosure. So will you please call me when you guys have issues and when you, when you think, should I? The answer is yes. And then there's a lot of things that we know as management from living out here so long, Cindy and I and Martha and everybody else around here, we know certain things that we might be able to help you with help you make the right decision to disclose it properly. Um, so like I said before, do we have lunch here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I invite you guys to grab lunch and then come back here if you have things that you wanna train on. Can we give Robert one more big hand? <laughs> All right, hold on guys. Hands in the air for Julie. Give her, give her some love so she can have a